So could you um, state your name, sure. uh, your age, where you are from, or what you're looking okay. to? Sure, my name is Wendy Wong. Um, I am. I turned 45 on March 20th, mm-hmm. so uh, just recent 45, and I'm a graduate of the University of Maryland, class of 1997. Okay. Um, could you tell us about uh, where you were born and where you were brought up? Sure. I was born in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, but then we traveled around. So I had lived in Chicago, Illinois, um, and before that a few places down south, but not long enough for me to remember or not very significant. But then from Chicago, um, or yeah, Chicago, Illinois, I was there for until... I think moved to Maryland in nine, when I was in f- third grade. Yeah, mm-hmm. so third grade. Um, moved to Gaithersburg, Maryland. So I went to Brown Station Elementary and there for, I think, a couple of years. And then my dad got the opportunity to move abroad, so to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So I had the opportunity to attend international school there. So I was there for fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. And then that brought me back to Maryland, and I attended Quince Orchard High School in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and from there went to the University of Maryland. And at College Park, I had wanted to go out of state, wanted to go to Berkeley, but my dad said, uh, or my parents said they would only pay for in-state school, so I went for Maryland. <laughs> so that's how I ended up there. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, I think growing up in Saudi Arabia really exposed me to a lot of different cultures that I had not um, even thought about at, at, up until that point. So I went to school with, you know, Canadians, people from Sri Lanka, I mean, India. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, we were able to inter, um, really engage with the Muslim community there, you know, had to wear the you know, the outer covering, the abaya, not the haji, but I think that just really started um, having me think about the global world and different cultures and um, ethnicities, and that was kind of, I think, like a starting point of me wanting to learn more about, um, just more about culture, and not necessarily Asian American or Chinese American, but I am Chinese American. and I did go to Chinese school on Sundays while I was in high school, um, which I did not enjoy. But <laughs> um, so that's kind of like that part of my life. And then coming to Maryland, um, and I'm not exactly sure when I discovered, you know, really thought about Chinese American, my Chinese American identity. Um, But I think it was, and I can't remember which class, but kind of talking about, you know, the Chinese working on the railroads and um, I think all the different student clubs um, like CCC, KSA, there's just so many, ASU, um, I think it kind of just really broadened my, I guess, I don't know, just, I think because it was so in close proximity Um, it just made me think more and I think, you know, being in the Asian American, I know it was Asian American women, I think it was Asian American women that I first started off in, um, just thinking about, um, Asian Americans in the United States, how, you know, how did we contribute, what, um, and I had never thought about these things at all, or even, um, Asian, you know, just, our relationship, the U.S.'s relationship in uh, different Asian countries in terms of like Vietnam, um, just never thought about it at a higher level. Um, Because as, I mean, I think for most high school still today, it's a very limited perspective. So I think in college, that's when, you know, I just started to start thinking more about questioning my identity, my background, and what did it mean to be you know, Chinese American, Asian American, and um, and then learning about other ethnicities like the Vietnamese, the Korean, you know, Indian, Pakistan. I mean, it runs a wide spectrum. So, I 
I don't exactly remember the moment when it was very clear like we we needed to start something formal. Um, I just know that there was a group of us that were really passionate about having a formal program because there were other universities that had programs. Um, so I, I mean, this is my recollection of coming up with working for an Asian American studies program was through sitting in the bathroom, um, sitting on the toilet, just be specific, but soon, and then it just came to my head. Um, because, but it was great because it was counter hegemonic to, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So it was perfect. Um, and for me, I think it was also important. I thought it would be a program that would draw students. Um, I thought, I thought it would be popular. Um, so I was thinking about it also from a financial perspective. I felt that it would have a, it would not just be a value to, you know, the greater growth of um, a student and the university, but just also when you're trying to attract, you know, a wide diversity of people to the campus, I thought this was, you know, something important to fight for as well. And at the time, there was African American studies, women's studies. Latino studies um, and there was just we were missing and so it was only appropriate to kind of pave pave the way for something um, more permanent mm -hmm. um, but yeah I just want to emphasize that piece like I think it's also important looking at like the economic value a program c can bring not just that it's important in terms of research but also, as I was saying earlier, just the economic impact mm -hmm. to an, you know, for a university. And it kind of balances out, um, you know, the different perspectives that you need to have, um, you know, in the world, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's in engineering or medicine, um, jazz, you know, you need to have the different perspectives because in reality, you have so many different people participating in those industries or in, in you know that type of work so I think it's important to have an Asian American studies program to um, you know the level the playing field mm -hmm. and have a balanced perspective yeah um. yeah I think it's a big thing about you know also just making that group of people feel included in the school I think you know you have all those other groups to represent other people that right. don't have that and you don't have that means to I guess educate too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it was ex really, it was very exciting in the sense that, um, so it was great that we had the guidance to work with the administration. So as I mentioned, doc for me, Dr. Marsha Genzer was significant in kind of being um, a sounding board and, um, you know, help us with um, secure finances to you know, go to San Francisco State and um, out to San Francisco to do research on Asian American studies programs out there. Um, but then, you know, when you're trying to create a movement, it has to be grassroots usually. I mean, to really, I think, create that, that firm base. Um, and so it was amazing. Like I we had to reach out to the LGBTQ, um, you know, the Latino student, I mean, everybody, Jewish mm -hmm. students, it did, you know, even the Greek, uh, the Greek, oh my gosh, is it Greek? It's not Greek. Greek life. Yeah, Greek yeah. life. I mean, <laughs> so it was just everybody. Mm -hmm. So that was, I think, um, as I remember, I thought it was very important that we, you know, talk to everybody mm -hmm. um, so they could really understand how it could relate to them or does relate to them. So I thought we did a great job at that time in um, you know, communicating the importance of an Asian American studies program. Yes, we did the whole chalking, do the hunger strikes, and um, you know, those types of things, and holding the East Coast Asian Student Union Conference, which was really big for us. Um, I mean, it drew thousands um, you know, to, to focus on Asian American um, issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a pretty big accomplishment at that time. Um, 
and I just remember the, in the beginning, like having Dana Tysoon Burgess to do dance. You know, you have Phil, Dr. Phil Tijitsu Nash, you know, doing history. We had, um, Yes, Dr. Sangeeta Ray. I mean, you just have so many different perspectives within the Asian American community. Um, it's it's key to be able to tap into those resources mm -hmm. and make those resources available mm -hmm. to you know students, faculty in the greater community. And there's uh, I don't know the exact probably demographics of Maryland in terms of. University of Maryland, and then just the com the immediate community in terms of um, what the percentages are. But they were at that time fourteen percent. There was a newspaper. I think we called it fourteen percent because it was representative of the Asian uh, demographics at that time on campus. So I mean, that's a significant amount. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, we're gonna. We want to just sure. a little bit and kind of work. Yeah, that. absolutely. So, um, so going back to I think your like grade school experience and coming into college, um, were you aware of your ethnic identity? What was the relationship that you had um, with your ethnic identity, um, sure. especially you know going to an international culture, right? Um, and then coming back to American culture, um, and then moving into college or in high school also. What was that like? So I'll kind of, I'll probably jump around all over the place, but I think, you know, food is obviously a connector. Um, so Chinese food, you know, that my parents cooked, um, you know, they played mahjong with their friends. Um, and, I, you know, I want to say in terms of a, in a negative way, it's just probably students in school using derogatory terms and um, so I think that was kind of a negative you know I, that's when I started to kind of feel some of the negative aspects of being you know Chinese or Asian and um, that you know that obviously were you called those yeah, terms? yeah like chink you know sure mm -hmm. I'll just the the standard <laughs> um, terms that you know people would um, or just like the ching chong with the silverware, those jokes, and um, and I just kind of, you know, I just disregarded it. I didn't really do much about it. Um, and I also remember with my nose, um, you know, at least in West, Western culture, like it's nice to have, it's, you know, it's looked upon nicely to have like the high bridge. And so I felt I didn't have a bridge so I couldn't wear certain glasses, and I remember putting a clothespin on my nose to see if I could like hire the arch up here. Um, so those are some of the maybe earlier um, types of things that I had recognized about being Chinese or being Asian, but it was mainly surrounding, surrounding food. Um, and my parents did speak Chinese at um, home, and we celebrated Chinese New Year, but it wasn't it was more, it wasn't so elaborate. Um, but yeah, it was very, I would say it's, it was very on the, on the outer shell. I mean, it wasn't so intense. So it was there obviously, but I didn't think too much about it. You know, it's like you're mm -hmm. born into it, eat Chinese food, you know, and that was kind of my extent. I didn't think too much beyond um, that level mm -hmm. and yeah. your um, sorry, but, um, yeah and so uh, and were your parents first generation immigrants or were, were they uh, were they also Chinese American no they were first generation immigrants they came over for graduate school mm -hmm. yeah but they were both um, from China although my mom she she had to her family had to um, escape to Burma um, and so she, I would say she grew up in Burma, so, and then went to Taiwan for university and then came here for grad school, but originally born in China and I think her formative years were in China. Um, and my dad was, he was always in China. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, 
Also, if you have your question, yeah. Jump up. One question. So yeah. Going into college, what sure. did you want to do? What was your major? You know, what did what was the degree you uh, actually graduated? So I graduated <laughs> with women's studies, okay. but that took five years to okay. get there. But I did the traditional. My parents had always thought I'd be great at social work. Mm -hmm. I did not go in that route because I felt I, I was not emotionally cut out for it. I felt, you know, it's a very um, just emotional draining uh, field. And I don't think I would have, you know, be able to survive the longevity of it, you know, long term. So I wanted to do pre-med. Not that that sounds like that's any better. But I think I was like, oh, I want to be like everybody else and do pre-med. But that didn't last very long. So mm -hmm. then I did business and I changed around like five times. Um, what did you mean by everybody else? Um, I'm sorry, what was that? Or, when uh, I like when you say everybody else, um, was that referring to anyone in particular or just... Oh, uh, I just think, else? you know, like growing up, you once again, like the traditional stereotypes. And, and then I don't think there are also th stereotypes. I mean, you do see a lot of Asian Americans being there and perhaps East Asian mainly, maybe back then, but um, being doctors and lawyers and, you know, the white collar professions and engineering. So I think maybe I had wanted to gravitate towards that, um, but I wasn't, like I wasn't brought up very strict, you know, I wasn't, um, my parents weren't very strict, surprisingly. Um, they weren't, yeah, they were quite casual and chill. And, um, and so I think sometimes I wish they were harder on me, but I didn't even break a thousand on my SAT. So that was like, you know, that was awful. That was just devastating. Um, I think they didn't, they tried to avoid that in conversations when I was in high school. Um, so, yeah, so I think they wanted me to do social work or they had, they didn't, they just suggested that. They said, you love people. This sounds like it would be a great, you know, track for you to explore. And perhaps there was that some of that, I'm going to do something my parents don't want me to do. Um, so I just kind of tried to do your traditional like pre-med and everything. that did not work. That was not me. So I eventually, um, I think after two years or three years, I switched into women's studies, and that was um, that was transformative. Because um, just like Asian American studies, you start to really dive deeper into you know women's history, some you know the challenge that women. I mean, you really you know drill down on on so many levels that you weren't thinking about women. You know, I wasn't thinking about women at all at any phase in terms of like historical, uh, political, economical at all until college. So, um, and I think that was the case for, you know, Asian American studies. Um, it just never crossed my mind until it was presented to me. Um, yeah, so. Um. So, okay, um, so one of the things that you mentioned was that um, when you came into college, you right. started um, being in proximity to many Asian American groups, mm -hmm. especially you mentioned Asian American women. Right. Um, could you expand more on that experience and um, what that, uh, like, what that meant for you at the time? Sure. I mean that. Um... It wasn't, and I would have to say it was just men too, Asian American men. Um, it's just that it's very, if you put yourself in that community, just like any community you put yourself in, it's very saturated. And so it was very different from what my upbringing was in terms of high school. It's very, um, I don't know, there weren't that many Asian Americans, maybe a handful that I remember in, in my class. And so then to be surrounded by, or have the option to like immerse yourself and just be around people that look similarly to you, or at least within the Asian American, um, you know, community and being able to um, share similar stories, even though you, they're, you know, we're of different ethnicities. Um, learning about Korean food or Indian food or, you know, whatever it is, um, just having that exposure um, and just hearing similar experiences. And I guess in terms of women, 
I had done my, I think, my senior paper on Asian American lesbian organizations and to see if they kind of do an analysis or a critique to see what was their impact in the Asian American space and the greater community and how impactful um, were these organizations. Um, and so, yeah, I think it just gave me a pathway to learn about different communities um, that just, you know, I just didn't have that before. So I think, um, you know, I didn't think about Asian American women on any sort of, you know, deeper level than just, oh, you're my friend or, you know, but so in the university setting, you just really got to, um, you know, understand those issues. Um, and I think at a very um, detailed level, understand the challenges different communities face. Um, and I think that struck a chord with me because I, at least for me, I wasn't thinking on that level, you know, whether it's mental health um, or if it's, you know, food, in a, you know, food inequality, um, immigration. I mean, none of those issues ma mattered to me when I was growing up or, you know, especially even in high school, my senior year, um, it was all, all in college where these, these issues heightened um, my awareness and my interest in being able to understand how it relates to the greater, um, you know, community in the world. Um, so, yeah, so that's pretty amazing. Um, so what led up to the formation of was and like the group of students that sure that you were with at the time how did yeah. um, how did you all come together and um, what did that look like so i think i mean i mentioned christina Lagdameo earlier but I, we were in a class together and and we, what year was this? i was probably i was a junior okay. so i was 95 I, I think don't quote me but <laughs> I'm so bad with math but I want to say 95 because I got burned out so and then I didn't do anything really my last year mm -hmm. but um I mean there's like Shuen Oh there's Betty Wong there was you know Cookie Ponya um Tone Yuen I mean there's this like missing probably tons of people but um yeah there was like I think we were in a class and just clubs and just talking about it and I think it just sparked um, it just fueled like a, a bunch of us to want to move forward and we were excited I think about you know other programs at other universities and I think really um, understanding like Wow, I, I think for me at least the number fourteen percent really stuck with me because that's a significant percentage of a of any population, and and I think understanding at that time there was not a formal program. You had all these other programs. Why did we not? In in a, and there was also an East East Asian uh, studies program. So I think you know, having this kind of awareness and you're like, where's our place um, in the in the future? You know, where, you know, we want to be able to um, ensure that um, 20 years, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, indefinitely, um, the work that we do, and also not just currently, but just in the past, there's still, Probably a lot of um, historical um, events, or you know, just that haven't been explored yet, mm -hmm. and that need to be. So, um, you know, from that perspective, you need to have that longevity of a program to do more expansive work. Um, you know, I remember being fascinated about the Hmong community in in the Midwest. So. I hope that door is open. Okay, sorry. Um, so, 
you know, that was that was fascinating towards me. I mean, for me, I'd never heard of actually the Hmong community. Oh, should we stop for a second? Yes. So yes. <laughs> Recording again. Yeah. Um, yes. So you were discussing the Hmong. Uh, the Hmong community. Yes, yeah. Hmong community. So I think it's just you know being exposed to a lot of historical data to an information um, that we never. I mean, we were like what, early twenties, at least for me, early twenties, and. It's like, wow, all this time, I had never known that we had contributed, you know, at least Chinese um, people had contributed to the building of the railroad, uh, excuse me, railroad, or had picked cotton in the South, I think, and they were paid for it, but still that we were part of um, the community, American community and the economy um, at that time doing I mean, because when I'm thinking cotton, I'm thinking of slavery, African Americans, um, and as I said, I think we Chinese people were being paid to do this. I mean, very minimal, but um, you know, I didn't know that until I was in college. So, you know, and just you know, contributions of like Yuri Kochiyama. I mean, you can just go on and on, and so it's when you're thinking about the scope of that. You want to be able to, you know, capture. You have a formal program so you can instill, you know, future leaders um, within the Asian American community and beyond, not just within the Asian American community, but you know, like Un Yang, uh, news anchor uh, for, you know, NBC Four. She's a graduate of, um, you know, Maryland's journalism program, just like Connie Chung, um, and she's. And Un Yang's in you know DC, and and she's phenomenal. And you know she wasn't part of the Asian American Studies program, but she um, I just think about her and her work in the community, um, being in a Maryland alum, um, and then also. I think I'm going off on a tangent. Do you want to like shift? Yes. Back? Yeah. I'm also going to <laughs> shift the camera just yeah. a little bit. Okay, cool, great. Um, yeah, so um, so going back specifically to Watts, right. um, in terms of like what, um, so like around when was that founded and what did that look like? Okay. Um, I know you were one of the founding members. Right, so I th once again, I think it was 1995, maybe 94, late 94, mm -hmm. but I want to say it's 95. Um, like I said, I think it was with all of the students at that time, they, we were just so engaged or inspired by the classes that we were taking, and just the conversations that um, that we were having in different communities um, in terms of whether it was women's studies or um, you know Asian Asian American Student Union, whatever wherever that was. But it was just I guess contagious at that time, and we all wanted to do something to ensure, as I was saying earlier, the longevity of Asian American studies since there was um, formal programs at other universities. I felt with the percentage of the population being Asian American, um, that's something that we, I thought, it was just a, the right time. And especially knowing that, <laughs> just get a recording. <laughs> so, you want me to start over? <laughs> um, just maybe okay. one or two sentences. Yeah. So, um just knowing at that knowing that there were previous attempts to create a Asian American studies program I think you know having the support that we had at that time and that guidance we were able to create a really solid foundation so we could really move create something um substantive mm -hmm. um and cuz I think we had you know, we there was a strategic plan. It wasn't like we were just gonna try to get some person off the street and teach a class, or you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was very. Right. I think it was um, done very professionally. Um, I was an emotional basket case at that time, but I think overall, you know, the others involved, um, we took the right steps. Um, we took, you know to lay down the different pieces that we needed. And we had, as I said, great guidance and great mm -hmm. support. Um, so what were the steps that you did? I think, I mean, asking? steps, like I think, 
you know, I remember at that time I was learning about protests. And so, you know, one part is you're looking at grassroots, you know, how do we communicate a message? You know, there's all, you know, there's, um, yeah, so it's your strategic plan or like a business plan. You have to look at marketing, outreach, you know, and that's like student groups, faculty, staff. And I mean, you have to cover, you know, horizontally and then vertically top down. Mm -hmm. So top down is like students, staff, faculty, you know, the administration. I mean, in, engaging everybody because if this is a university program, you need to engage everybody at every level. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was just, that's one element of it. And then being thoughtful, you know, examining or researching other programs, kind of seeing what kind of classes they had offer in their curriculum, and just like what we were interested in. And then seeing who locally um, could, like had mentioned um, Dana Tysoon Burgess, he has his, you know, his dance company that's, um, that's local here. And so I think it was accessing you know, accessing, um, you know, resources in the vicinity. So in terms of a cost perspective, um, you know, we started, I think, modestly, you know, just kind of, and then what did that look like? What other classes, who would oversee it? Like Dr. Sun Kyung Kim from um, Women's Studies, she was really integral at the beginning, I think, and was the director of the program I can't quote the years, but mm -hmm. I mean, just looking at what we had on campus first and then making those alliances. And so, yeah, just a lot of, you know, grassroots, top down, you know, left to right, yeah. just, you know, casting the wide net, making sure that we um, t had a touch point at every level that we thought was, you know, key in creating a movement, not just a student movement, but a movement in order to create something sustainable. Yeah. Um, can you just state for us really quick what WASP stands for? Yeah, WASP stands for Working for an Asian American Studies Program. Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> um, so could you tell us about your involvement specifically? What did um, you do in uh, those years, 95 to 97. Seven, yeah. Um, I, and if you have any particular like stories that you want to share about, um, yeah. you know, what you did in your experience. Right. Um, it's all a blur, but I know like Christina and I um, met with uh, Dr. Marsha Gensler and we had numerous meetings and she would, you know, guide us on, you know, how we should, you know, maybe structure meetings or who we should invite, what's our approach. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, because she was, you know, part of the university system already for quite some time and she's, I think she's the director of the STEM Student Union. Um, she was at that time? Yeah, I forgot what she was doing at that time, but now I think she's the director of the STEM Student Union, but she was very involved with like, um, I don't know all the terms, but the student uh, groups or the student initiatives. I mean, she was based at the Stamp Student Union. I think she's still based there. She's been there forever. Um, but no, she just had a great, um, I think, pulse on the university community, ranging from students to administration to faculty. So, you know, that was one portion of it. And then being engaged with, obviously, my, um, my fellow students, I mean, I mean, we had tons of meetings, there were just late nights, like, I don't know, like doing, making posters, or, you know, what are we going, when we do this strike, what is, what's the purpose? How are we, are we just gonna just stand out there? Or like, what's the strategy? <laughs> you know, we did strategies like, okay, and this night we wanna do chalking, and then this night we'll be out um, in front of Stamp Union, you know, doing skits and, you know, this day we'll be doing, I mean, I don't remember creating the calendar, but we had a series of events to kind of keep things moving. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was exhausting. Um, just, you know, storming the, you know, president's office. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just to, 
you know, bringing a costume, you know, going to the um, conference, you know, I forgot which year, but then the font bidding for it, then bring it to University of Maryland. And that was, I mean, that was a lot of work in and of itself. Mm -hmm. and it's a large pro programmatic effort. Um, yeah, I just, we were just doing so many different things. It was exhausting, mm -hmm. you know, and then of course, and I remember there was definitely some pushback, but I don't, it wasn't that great where it stopped us, you know, I mean, I think people were very receptive um, and yeah, I think it was just being, to keep a pace. Mm -hmm. And I think what was great is, um, I don't know if we were necessarily, or I wasn't consciously recruiting, but you know, at Chris, uh, Christina's younger sister, Angela, you know, I think she was, you know, she was just two years younger, perhaps, or, but she was in the mix. And so I think we, at that time, we had a good reach of younger um, students uh, coming up, like freshmen, sophomore, sophomores that we knew that we could pass the torch. I mean, I think I just, at I think after a year and a half, I think I just burned out mm -hmm. and I really just kind of, I needed to graduate. Um, so it was just, it was a blur and it was exhausting on every level. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I just remember just constant meetings and just advocating, you know, meet, meetings with administration, meetings with student groups and um, I don't know, reaching out to the East Coast Asian student members. I mean, it's just, like I said, it's a multi-prong. It's not just one, you know, when you're running something, you really have to look at the big picture mm -hmm. and be able to tap into everything to create a really strong foundation mm -hmm. to make it successful. So, yeah, and just, you know, speaking with a lot of different um, students from other Asian American Studies programs mm -hmm. and kind of understanding what they were faced with. I mean, I know one issue was, oh, do you go on the route of ethnic studies um, versus Asian American studies? Um, and I don't remember why. I think because perhaps like African American studies and Latino studies at that time, you know, it would have had, it would have been a, a greater conversation if we wanted to create something right then and there, I, you know, I think Asian American studies was the safest route to go. Um, since I don't think at the time these other departments wanted to either fuse and and maybe we also, I don't think we had the bandwidth to have those conversations and perhaps um, between when I kind of left or graduated from Maryland and now maybe they've tried to have those conversations but I think those programs are still intact mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and there is no ethnic studies program. So I think, um, yeah, and it's, and it's like, and hopefully it's thriving or at least it's, it seems like it's, um, it's, it's a constant. Um, I mean, hopefully there's, it would be great to see a growth again, mm -hmm. which I, hopefully there will be one. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any particular vivid memories or any, um, any particular things that really takes you back to that time? Yeah, I just think how goofy we had to be in order to say sane. I mean, just like Christina's crazy laugh and Noel Varian's crazy laugh and just, you know, Foo was, yeah, they were just, everyone was quirky in their own way and it was just being able to stay sane. And like, you know, you're having like nights till 2 a.m., 3 a.m. and then, you know, succeeding in your classes and then going to do things in the community. I think it was just, yeah, just being able to reconnect and just laugh about mm -hmm. things and cry if we wanted to. I think probably more laughing for me and just being exhausted, you know, but knowing you had a group where you could, um, I think, be how you want it to be at that time. And since everyone was so high energy, I think that just, I mean, that helped fuel the movement um, for quite some time. I mean, it's pretty incredible just 
everyone's energy and commitment um, that, e that each person had, but, and, you know, just the thoughtful conversations that I'd had with Christina, but even the graduate advisors at the time was like Ling Ye, Guana Chang, Will Liu, um, there's in Donna Lim, um, and later on like Sharon Prosser. I mean, there is, I feel like it was a good balance of, um, people involved and so that was you know that was a fond memory you know like it wasn't like we we're struggling for people to help us like people wanted to help us on all different mm -hmm. levels and I think um you don't you don't get that all the time so I think we were lucky like from right from the jump we had just you know a great group of students that were really dedicated and committed like I said, just had a great sense of humor because if there is no sense of humor, we would, I don't know, I don't think we would have survived. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, I think for me, I identified people's laughs. So each person, you know, like Cookie, you know, I keep on mentioning their names, like Schwinn, Betty, you know, everyone has their laugh um, that I can remember that would keep me going. And um, no, it was just an amazing group of, individuals um you know blood sweat and tears i mean that's what it came down to mm -hmm. to create that um that foundation yeah um and you kind of touched on it a little bit but could you expand maybe a little bit more on it seems like the community was like generally pretty accepting um did you find that the people trying to start the program were mostly asian american students or did you get a good mix of a lot of people who wanted to help you out? Um, I don't know if it was a balanced mix, but there was definitely a mix. Like mm -hmm. I think, you know, Black Student Union, they understand where we were coming from. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I, I wanna say we did a petition of some, you know, I think we petitioned for maybe a class or, but people signed, you know, from the, LGBTQ, Hispanic Student Union. I mean, it was, um, and I'm veering off track. What was your question again? Um, was just... just like, was everyone pretty like receptive oh, to okay. your mission? Um, yeah, I think, yeah. So, yeah, I think all in all, everyone was respect receptive. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, there are some newspaper articles, I think, uh, maybe... Um, I think not saying that it's they weren't in support of it but there was this like what was the you know just being the devil's advocate you know why do we need a program you know that those kind of conversations but yeah we had yeah we had every I think type of group but it's mainly Asian Americans yeah mm -hmm. you know other yeah white people black people you know all kinds of groups of predominantly, I would want to say Asian Americans, mm -hmm. for sure, yeah. yeah. Did you ever, um, did you ever have any, like, major frustrations during your time there, or any major pushback that you, that, that you all in turn had to, I guess, kind of, like, that you were in conflict against? I think, I can't say for, I can't, obviously can't speak for everybody else, mm -hmm. but I think for me, since I was emotional, like I think I didn't have an emotional outlet, like like channeling that, like having a conversation with somebody, like how do you, um, because I think even within, you know, my peers, I think those were moments of just, um, about the program and just the intensity of it, but then outside of that, it was like, you know, the kind of the burnout. And then not, I don't think I had the conversations I think that I probably could have had with certain people about it. Um, maybe there was a sense of guilt. I have no idea. I just know that I was so burnt out and I just like didn't want to have anything I think to do with it. Not in terms of supporting it, but it was more of like I did my part you know, the torch is passed, it seems like it's in good hands, mm -hmm. I don't need to worry. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like, I was more of like, 
I, I saw that and then I just shifted out. Um, so there wasn't, yeah, it was more of like a, an, a, not an abrupt, you know, kind of, yeah, it was kind of like I'm done, I, you know, mm -hmm. and let other people kind of, you know, push the program and move it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that was maybe something like looking back, I didn't, um, I didn't know how, you know, who to speak with because it's like you wanted to be somebody like all together and, you know, keep composed. Um, but I think I had a lot of just questions of, you know, what, you know, at some point, you know, you're so invested, then you're like, oh, why am I doing this? <laughs> or, you know, I got to graduate. I have other things I need to, you know, I wasn't sure if Asian American studies was, you know, long term for me. Mm -hmm. And so I think I just needed a break. Um, so I think, you know, I may have wanted to handle that better, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's actually a great segue. So uh, I guess if we want to discuss, um, like, so how did that, um, how did this experience affect you after college? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think, I mean, during my last year, I got involved with um, jazz music. Um, not, I didn't play any instruments, but I think, you know, I went to the Asian American Jazz Festival in Chicago, and, you know, jazz to me was a medium where I could see all cultures and ethnicities be together in a, like a harmonious, like, you know, in a harmonious way. Um, so I committed probably the next five years um, working within the jazz industry, you know, worked on at Black Entertainment Television on jazz when it was around, the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz, which is now the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz. Um, I, you know, worked at the New England Conservatory in Boston and from there finally made it to the Big Apple, you know, where's like that's where if you want to do jazz that's where you need to be um so worked at a jazz artist management agency worked at the Bruno Jazz Club so it was just jazz like for five years um five to six years and then then I transitioned <coughs> while I was in New York into the hospitality industry and then eventually moved back to Maryland, um, but I worked at the Ritz-Carlton in Washington, D.C. and um, learned the luxury hotel market while I was there, and then transitioned to restaurants afterwards, and now I'm working um, at the Capital Area Food Bank. So it's hospitality and food, but in a different, um, in a different way. And so, you know, I wanted to be a bit more engage with the local community and understanding how um, food and secure communities are served and being part of that process or understanding how that that system works so and i just started like probably five weeks ago yeah oh, cool yeah 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 so mm -hmm. and what's funny on one of my first site visits uh it was a community market for capital area food bank and it was on a saturday you know, to get there around seven, uh, by eight o'clock a.m., but there was already like a significant line, about like 50 people, and they were actually mainly were Chinese and spoke Mandarin or Cantonese. And so I had never envisioned my first site visit with Chinese speaking people. And I actually broke out my poor, my, my you know, very basic Mandarin. And you're not thinking, you know, in this area, there's every group um, is food insecure, but you just sometimes, if you're not in the field, you're blind to it. So not that I didn't think there were Asian, you know, Asian Americans um, in food insecure situations, but to just see it the first time out on a site visit, I was maybe not shocked. It was kind of in between surprised and shocked. I mean, it was 30 Chinese people there and it kind of brought me back to, you know, Asian American studies in terms of understanding um, 
the very Asian communities within the United States. Um, yeah, and so that was, it kind of just was a, yeah, it kind of shocked me. Yeah, and I just thought, and I immediately thought of Asian American studies um, because there, you know, that site location is not too far from um, Chinatown in DC. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it's like understanding the aging populations uh, in, in low, com, low income population um, within the Asian community in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. So. I think it's funny. I didn't think too much about Asian American studies post graduating. I mean, I I have, but not extensively. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like in this opportunity with the Capital Area Food Bank, it's like slowly coming back, mm -hmm. um, and I'll be needing to reach out to former organizations that I, you know, that I had learned about back then, like the Organization of Chinese Americans, to see if I can find some translators for some of our market sites to help um, this community um, transition into a new uh, um, program. And they have to sign the form. You know, so it's just strange how it's like, it's like full circle. Um, not completely, but kind of, you can see it kind of moving um, to that point and it's yeah, it's kind of neat um, but yeah it's so just taking my time with it and not you know pacing myself I think you know I anything I think anybody can relate about pacing I had mentioned earlier that um, I wish I knew how to maybe take care of myself better but in that part of it is also pacing yourself mm -hmm. so I think you get inspired by a lot of things but it's learning how to like properly channel it or or say it's okay to kind of keep it on hold for a little bit and not, you know, you don't need to sprint to the, you know, to the finish line, you know, so, um, but yeah, it's great to see different pieces come together again, you know, from, from Asian American studies. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Um, do you have any more questions? Um, I was going to ask a little bit, was there any, part of your culture growing up that you like enjoyed and shared maybe with your children, you know, like what, um, maybe you kind of taught them if anything. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's very minimal. I mean, aside from food, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's still a large part of it. Like, you know, no one Luke cook. I helped them, you know, they helped me prep, cut, you know, cut things and, um, you know, they're getting older, so they can learn to do from start to finish, mm -hmm. you know, uh, learn how to cook some dishes, but, um, I haven't, so it's interestingly enough, I haven't spoken too much about Asian American or Chinese American history. They've read some books, but we haven't actually had more in-depth conversations. Mm -hmm. I think they're so engrossed in Little League Baseball. I guess just the other things have to mm -hmm. come in to place, but um, I think when there are moments that expose um, our culture, you know, we'll talk about it, but it's not, um, it's not prevalent, you know, it's not Chinese, um, like every which way, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I think it just comes when we um, happen to engage with mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. So I think I think that kind of uh, brings uh, our yeah, questioning kind sure. of close to the end. Um, I I'm pretty sure it's much higher than fourteen percent now. I think it's more than twenty percent. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, mean, just I think the Asian community and some of the de demographics that we have at the Capital Area Food Bank. Um, I wouldn't be surprised mm -hmm. yeah. about that. Um, and it's pretty cool. Like, I'm an Asian American Studies minor, and we're both taking a class in okay. Asian American Studies. So, um, you know, like, we're... What are you taking? Um, well, the class that we're in right now with Dr. Nash is yeah. pu uh, Public Poli Policies. Yes. Um, and then right now I'm also taking Oral History with Dr. Terry Park. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
No, I mean like these classes. Well, I mean aside from Phil's, but these like this the oral histories class is not offered, and clearly oral histories are really important. And mm -hmm. I think no, it's great work that you're doing. And I think as we're actually, I think we're more of a visual society more than ever. Um, I think doing these uh, oral history projects, um, it's great. And there's so many people to capture. Mm -hmm. um, no, and it's amazing that you're part of this program that we had started like 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's just, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's what's so amazing about when I stepped away. I mean, I really stepped away from it. I mean, aside from keeping in touch, you know, with people, um, you know, with that group, um, but just thinking back, sitting here and like looking at the both of you, I'm like, wow, it's like you, you've been able to take advantage of the program. Mm -hmm. And um, no, that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just to see the contributions that you're not, I mean, not only making to Asian American studies, but you know, the technique of oral, oral histories and just, um, I don't know, like seeing where you'll be in the next like, two, five, ten years from now and to get an understanding of how Asian American studies has impacted, you know, the each of you. So I think that was also the intention of wanting to create Asian American studies. It's like I was impacted in this like crazy way. It's like I know other people will be impacted, if not on the same level, but in different ways. So I think the thought of like being able to reach countless people and how that would impact their work with whatever industry they end up in but at least being sensitive to um, a group of people that they may have not been aware of before or or even or if they're aware um, to give more thought to them in whatever they're doing yeah I hope to see the Asian American Studies program double in size in terms of matriculation. From what I understand, it's 800 annually. It'd be great to see 1,600 students go through the program in the upcoming years, or at least grow to that level. Um, and I hope students will um, take their experiences from each of these classes and think about it holistically, you know, whether it's they continue in business or medicine, um, anthropology, um, hospitality, but to take their experiences and um, relate that to their work in the future. Um, and good luck. I hope there will be another wave of student activists to bring the minor program into an Asian American Studies major program.